it is now 201, so we'll get started. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on emergency preparedness best practices with presenters from Bakersfield American Indian Health Project and Beretti Inc. My name is Aaliyah Smith Gomez, and I am a project coordinator with the Research and Public Health Division at NACUI. Joining me from NACUI are Yvonne Ito, the program manager, Lamar Weaver, the communication associate, and Amaya Fellows, a NACUI intern. We are honored to have you all here. We kindly ask that you place your name, organization, and tribal affiliation and title into the chat box. In addition, we welcome any feedback you would like to provide about your webinar experience in our survey, which is posted in our chat box. As shown in the agenda, we will begin the session overview with an overview and some housekeeping, followed by an introduction of our wonderful presenters and then the content. We will end the session with a Q&A and adjourn promptly at 3 p.m. For those of you who are unfamiliar with NAKUI, here is a little background. The National Council of Urban Indian Health, also known as NAKUI, is the national nonprofit organization devoted to the support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health and public health services for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. NAKUI is the only national representative of the 41 Title V Urban Indian Organizations, or UIOs, under the Indian Health Service and the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, or IHCIA. NAKUI strives to improve the health of over 70% of the AIAN population that lives in urban areas, supported by quality, accessible healthcare centers. As we dive into our session, here are a few things to keep in mind. The session is being recorded. All mics have been muted. Questions can be typed in the chat box. A Q&A will follow at the end of the session. And please note that the QR code at the bottom of the screen can be scanned with your phone to access the survey. I will now introduce our presenters for this session. Johnny Delgado currently serves as the Grants Program Director at Bakersfield American Indian Health Project. He has been with BAIHP since 2019, and he has served in various roles with BAIHP, including human resources, safety and compliances, project management, and grant management. Our next speaker is Abel Varela, who currently serves as a safety, health, and environment professional at Beretti, Inc. He has experience with OSHA regulations, and he is also an instructor for the National Fire Protection Association and the National Safety Council. And I will now pass it on to our presenter for their presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so our year one scope of work we had under Storytellers Grant uh, was to develop and deliver safety support service in the form of safety inspection of new facility of the new our new facility emergency program development and safety training specific to our organization's hazards uh, to hone skills to ensure prevention of exposure and injury our detailed safety physical review of the new facility includes focus uh, with the focus on evacuation emergency uh, egress directions and location for assembly signage and equipment location for emergency equipment methods used to enunciate and notify emergency and evacuation, and if they are centrally monitored and where. Uh, maintenance of emergency and fire suppression systems, there's a fire extinguisher, fire sprinklers, facility maps, including egress mapping and signage and response, um, written report and photos um, that include findings, outlining emergency inspections, inconsistencies and gaps, Recommendations discussed to improve the emergency response equipment and mapping. So we purchased a new facility last year. And so when we got awarded this grant, it was perfect timing and aligned with the needs of our new facility. And so the plan one was written to really develop all the safety plans that we needed um, as it relates to emergency preparedness. And here's a short video of the facility um, and some of our areas of how it looked before and after. 
So the facility itself has went through a, it was considered a light renovation. Um, flooring had to replace, wall had to replace. We had to really um, look at the layout of the facility as well. Um, you know, change a couple of walls and uh, knock out a couple of walls, add a couple of walls and such. Um, here's our couple few pictures of some of the items that we purchased, some of the storage tellers year one funding. Um, as you can see in the first picture, there's the card for the, that pops out from the wall, um, it's fire extinguisher located. Um, the fire extinguisher itself has to be visible um, from all directions. So if you're in a room and it's flat against the wall, more commonly you see them flat, it doesn't really stick out. And so let's say you're against that wall and you look over, you might not see the sign. And so it was important to us that we get the placards that actually pop out. Below it is the evacuation map. Um, that's the old one. We have a new one and we have a picture of that later on the slide to show you what our new one looks like. Fire extinguisher is there with the inspection tag on it. Uh, we have a company that comes in and services them annually. And there's our first aid kit. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next picture is uh, the first aid kit opened up. So you can kind of see some of the contents inside of it. We initially had uh, medication stored in them, but we decided it was best to take them out from a HR standpoint. Um, if somebody were to have a allergic reaction and take the medication, company potentially li liable. So to remove that liability, we removed it. And then um, the next last picture is of the fire alarm. Um, that's what our fire alarm system looks like when you, well, the handle itself when you pull it out. Next picture, there's a couple of the lights there on the first on the first picture. There's one on the ceiling, one on the wall. Um, those are throughout the facility. They light up, they make, they are the, the enunciators as well. So you'll hear this, um, the alarm going off if that handle is pulled. We also added some lights, so some area, those areas outside the facility that are pretty dark um, that pose the hazard as well, though. Um, we want to make sure this case uh, it's dark, you know, it's more the winter time that staff can see. So we added lights throughout the facility to kind of light up that area and around the parking lot as well. Um, there's also a camera there. Um, part of our plan as well and the whole looking at the facility and securing it was uh, the camera system too. Um, the next one, uh, the last picture is of our shower. Uh, we have a couple of showers in the facil uh, facility. The facility originally was, I think it was a sleep study program. So they had showers uh, already there. Uh, we just retell them, we kept them. Um, the idea behind it is you need a eye washing station or if somebody gets a hazardous chemical spilled on them, this is where they go to, to rinse off. Gates, uh, we used our house funding to secure the facility and we had to address egress. Um, part of egress is to have the panic bar right there. So you push it, the door opens up, but we also needed to make sure that the facility was secured so people can't just walk in and roam the facility or break into it. Um, and so as a result of that, we added the uh, trilogy locks. So on the outside of the lock itself, you can see the, uh, the pin code, you just you know, put in your code in there and it opens up. Batteries get serviced annually, um, but from the outside, you can just push it open. We did have several break-ins of the facility in uh, initially, um, and so those spikes were added on the top, and then we added on the padlock on the outside. Um, we open it up, and then we usually hang it on the inside uh, throughout the day, and we lock it so people can't take it off and take it. Um, and then the last person who's they throws a lock on the outside. The idea is if anybody's on, if anybody's here on staff, we're going to leave it unlocked. If nobody's here, we're going to lock it just in case somebody can still jump over those. As I said, we have cameras, you'll be surprised the upper body strength that some people have to pull themselves over those bars. Um, and it looks like I repeated that last picture by mistake. My apologies. Scope of work uh, for year two, <clears throat> we, um, Subverti was contracted to provide additional uh, time in support of the monthly safety services completed in 2022, including revising policies and procedures, 
Injury Illness Prevention Program, Emergency Action Plan, and Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan as needed. Audit and assess BIHP's competency as it relates to emergency preparedness. Provide training on emergency preparedness and related standard operating procedures. Evaluate methods of mitigation elimination. Evaluate training criteria and outcomes. Provide quality improvement, quality assurance services. So Abel will be going over more into that in more detail shortly though. Um, so after year one, as we say, we're still moving into the facility. Once you're in, we realize, uh, you know, because you constantly evaluate where things are at as part of the QI, QA process. Um, we then had to make several program changes in year two, such as updating our plans. Um, as I stated, our map for one was updated as well. And then additional trainings were determined to be needed as well. And additional hazards identified that weren't initially caught to begin with um, that we identified later throughout the course of actually occupying the facility. And this is the evacuation map. So this is a new one um, that we have here. The red arrows are the path to, tra uh, to travel. Um, and then the front, you can see the meeting point in the, uh, in the front parking lot right there, some trash cans that you have in there. And this is the um, uh, map of our actual facility here. And um, with this is gonna be posted and replacing all the spots that are throughout the facility. Um, you can see you are here. There's a star right there. That's where we created the map at. Uh, but wherever location you're at, it's going, that's going to move to the location of each map. Training topics of focus. Um, and I'll go ahead and let Abel take it from here. I appreciate it, Johnny. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, when we evaluated the whole uh, process, we got we came into with uh, Breakers for the American Indian Health Project. Uh, back in 2021, it was uh, it was at the former facility, and it was kind of the the beginning of our relationship with them. And uh, I will be the first to say that at first it was just going to be like a one time thing, and it was it, it it grew into this I think a great working relationship where they can call they know they can call me or email me, and it's. Uh, it's, I try to get to them as soon as I can. If usually if it's, if it's something pressing, I will make it a priority for sure. Um, but as we moved on into the new facility, we saw, Hey, this is what we want to do. This is what we, uh, uh, want to do versus what we need to do. And then we developed the training, uh, topics of focus. Um, I'm not going to read the list out to you, but the, our focus was going to be on the, on the bigger things, uh, such as active shooter, uh, uh, blood pathogens, uh, lockout tagout, heat illness, uh, because, and the emergency action plan, because those are the most prevalent things that we can see from a, from a hazard uh, assessment, what they were exposed, police were exposed to. Now, without being too redundant, uh, we first started off the whole introduction into hazard analysis as what do you recognize as a hazard versus what is a risk? And throughout the process, we start off with, hey, this is what we were, this is how we, in layman's terms, what a hazard is and what a risk is and how we compare. And that's how the mentality we use to kind of gauge what we need to do or what a training focus is going to be uh, based on the hazard risk that we, uh, that we, uh, what's it called, find. Some of the types of hazards are the most categorized into four major classes, and it's called through biological, the chemical, ergonomic, and physical hazards. And uh, anytime we bring this up, it's like just think of your bicep, but it's <laughs> obviously we just want to make sure that it sticks. That's the sticking point uh, biological, chemical, ergonomic, and physical. See, this, some of these are the biological hazards and the chemical hazards. Now, we it's kind of a catch-all and umbrella, but what we want to focus on is the bacteria, viruses, uh, and valuable pathogens on the biological side of things. And when it comes to chemical hazards, we really want to focus on the dust, the fume smoke, and uh, some vapors because maintenance happens. And then we also, uh, there's also, you know, uh, cultural tobacco use that we want to be able to recognize. And that was an, that was an important topic that we, that was, we, that we discussed 
uh, some time ago. We were able to uh, work through that because we, first of all, we wanted to make sure that employees were safe, but that we were still maintaining the cultural uh, aspect of it intact. Abel, if you don't mind if I jump in real quick. And, uh, Go ahead. So we smudge, uh, just to let everybody know, we do smudge in our facility, and that was a very, um, I want to say heated topic of this discussion, but it was a very uh, important topic of discussion note. Um, and with the capacity we utilize ABLE, we had to really explore um, whether or not we could smudge within our facility. Um, we don't use tobacco for smudging. Uh, a traditional tobacco, we use uh, sage uh, traditionally, um, sometimes sweetgrass. Um, but we had to do a lot of research on uh, smudging in the facility to see if it's even, is it allowable legally and what the health hazards were to um, anybody within the facility at the time of smudging, where it's going to spread to. And we really um, had to create a plan of action to have that in place to address those concerns. And so it's uh, there hasn't been any issues with it um, since we put those plans in, but um, it, it did take a lot of work looking into that. And uh, we leaned on ABLE for a lot of information. Thank you. And, then, uh, and as we move forward, we'll go through the ergonomical hazards because we have a lot of admin staff. That's that's what it really is. So we want to focus on what their exposure is, what their jobs entail, uh, how they do their jobs, and is their workstation adequate for them? What can we do or what can we provide to make it to where they aren't overstressed or overstressing their body so we mitigate or prevent chronic injuries? And then there's the in-your-face physical hazards, things that you can hear, touch, uh, smell, anything like that. And that may mainly have may have to be with uh, maintenance, but everyday things like uh, walking surfaces, just your pathways. What we found through the facility is that we found a lot of uh, elevated lips on the walkways, which can uh, cause trip hazards, and we had to grind those down uh, for that reason. One of the things we wanted to we we trained on was active shooter. And now that took a lot of work. That took uh, a lot of detail. And uh, when you ask Johnny or Ruby from Bickerson Marketing Health, they'll tell you that it lasted maybe a total of ten minutes. But the planning behind that was to get agencies involved because we wanted to make sure that if we were gonna do a training, it was gonna be done respectfully and with and responsibly. The objective of active shooter training is to understand the concept of a situation, how to handle such situations, who does what, who's responsible for what, and recognizing violence in the workplace. Those things are some of the things we want to outline in the, in the training that we brought forth because in a moment of this high stress situation, we want to make sure that people that are, have some responsibilities will do their best or are at least equipped to act accordingly. Um, I'm a, you don't mind if I jump in on that as well. Um, so one of the things to add on that as well, that is that um, one of the biggest things we learned is this wasn't just tied to the training. It was the awareness behind what it actually looks like, though. So um, although we had the, the training um, designed for it, though, when it happened, as Abel said, it happened so fast that staff were completely caught by surprise. And um, we had some issues in terms of staff being in compliance for security, like closing the door behind them, don't leave it open, make sure this is closed, make sure this is locked. Um, and um, the person who performed the active, shoot, the active shooter, who was the active shooter is actually um, on this call now, uh, Mr. Johnny Hernandez from Beretti. And um, when he was able to move through the facility with ease, um, employees realized the significance of closing that door, closing that window, locking this or locking that was. Um, and they've been compliant ever since. So it was a great uh, opportunity, not just to train them on what to do, but the, to, to signify the importance of why, uh, what the plan is for. Now, during the training, uh, the active shooter training, we go into detail. Sometimes, some may say a little too much, but my style of training is to emphasize the importance of the situation because it's one of those things that you don't want it to happen. You hope it doesn't happen, but if it does, uh, at least you can re rely on that training. 
to a, at a very minimum. Uh, to during the training, we active, identified what an active shooter was, uh, how to react quickly, what to do, and we use the run hide fight method. Uh, and emphasize a fight is the last resort. We want you to go home to your families. We want we emphasize that the, there's going to be a tomorrow if you get out. You have a better chance of doing that. Uh, to call 911 if safe to do so, and you're okay. It's it's, it's fine. You can move to uh, and to be able to go into the whole detail of things. Now, uh, the whole this this whole those whole slides that we've shown previous to this, the whole reason why we were brought in is to this two methods of mitigation and elimination for the hazards. And we have a pyramid on the right. You see the hierarchy of controls. That is what we use as safety professionals. What to uh as our base to our, what we see a hazard, this is the process that we go to. Can we eliminate it? it can it be substituted by with, an, uh, with something else, with another process? Well, if we can't, can we engineer something to keep people away from this, both as a guard, a door, uh, some kind of cover? And do, if that doesn't work, can we bring in administrative controls? Uh, do we change the rotation of people? Can people be at, uh, at the desk uh, for X amount of time and then switch them out? And then lastly is the PPE, the last thing that you can have. Now, going back to the active shooter drill that we took place. Uh, so just to give you an insight as to uh, uh, how we went about it, I had to call the local fire police, uh, the local police department, the local fire uh, department, the local sheriff department, the local hospital and inform them all. Oh, and, and local uh, 911 dispatch if uh, to inform them all that we were going to have a training from this time to this time to kind of bring, uh, let them know that if, so, if somebody were to freak out and call 911, they would know not to send real police because it was not a real uh, threat. The, we came in, my, my colleague came in and we were able to make entrance uh, through the front of the building and our projected casualty was about 20 people, 22 people. And it was staggering and it was done with purposefully on the day that there was gonna be the most, be, uh, the most amount of people there. Uh, Employees were warned of the day that they were going to give a notice of it might happen during this time or during this time of day to give them at least uh, a notice that it was not going to be a real thing. But it's they're still caught people by surprise. And when we went through the evaluation and we sat down in the review, we were able to identify that a single door, like Johnny mentioned, uh, was the difference between two casualties and 22. And, and we don't want to have any, but if we had to pick, uh, we definitely want to have the lower number. Now, when we go and uh, do an assessment or a survey or in any kind of inspection, when we find hazards, we communicate the hazards and then we say, hey, okay, we don't want to just give you the problem. We want to give you the solution. So we'll go the process of, of recognizing the hazard uh, and I, what causes it, what's behind it, what's the, what's the root issue and what can we do to solve it? Not only practically, uh, but sustainably and uh, feasibly. When we, when we train, some of the employees, our, a lot of the focus spent was on um, first aid, CPR, and AED because people that are put into certain roles, such as the healthcare side or first responders in case of emergencies, they're going to be exposed to bloodborne pathogens or OPIMs, other potentially infectious materials. And right there on the screen, you're going to see that amount of exposure. Why we have certain things. E e location of the building Oops, is uh, sometimes we have as anywhere else transients but just um, sometimes we can have um, aggressive clients aggressive visitors or somebody who may not be in the best mental state so if there's for the that were the case you are exposed be, due to the nature of their behavior 
we looked at fire prevention and what can we do to what is uh, the hazard, what are the exposures due to the uh, level of, uh, of uh, equipment that was going to be at the facility and what needed to be done to prevent such fires from happening uh, without fires are already dangerous enough. We don't need to give them any help. Uh, we want to uh, not have daisy chaining. We want to have ports that are kept, that are maintained, that aren't broken, that aren't missing the third little prong, the grounding prong, uh, that we don't have a refrigerator to a surge protector to a uh, extension cord to a single wall outlet that already has uh, 10 other things plugged into it. So we looked at it. We want to make sure that we had that in place before we started going into putting in all the equipment. And then the response aspect of it, fire uh, sprinklers or and extinguishers. We did a training where we taught everybody how to use an extinguisher hands-on. Uh, and that also, so take some planning to do because obviously when you use an extinguisher, it's gonna spell out some kind of uh, content and we wanna make sure that people are ready for that, at least aware of that. Um, and the sprinkler systems, we they brought in a contractor and they somehow had to be switched out. And we, through the process of putting furniture in and, uh, and uh, having uh, things put into place, wanna make sure that we, kept certain things uh, in compliance by keeping a certain thickness level between furniture and the sprinkler systems. This all started off with a, an emergency action plan. And part of the emergency action plan, it gives you, and it's, you have the federal uh, regulation that but we follow Cal OSHA because it's in California. It's a little different, it's a little more stringent, but it's a little more detailed and it gives a, some direction as to what uh, what to do for emergency and what the requirements are. It, it asks for procedures for emergency evacuation, procedures to be followed by employees, uh, when, for what uh, emergency evacuation, and what procedures are for employees that are doing medical duties. It also gives you details for what the requirements are for their alarm system, uh, for the training, a verification of the alarm system. Uh, all those things were taken into consideration when we do the drills. Now, when we look at an emergency action plan, when we went into the building, we looked, hey, well, what, what is the natural path of exit? And we have this door, that door. Okay, so those are the path of egress. Egress is your way out, out of the building, where you are expected to exit up on an, an emergency. That's where you install panic course, where the doors have to be uh, set up to the way they open out into your path of travel. Uh, you need to have lit exit signs for the location of them. And how are you going to communicate an evacuation? What is it? It's got to it be, it's got to be more than vocal. What can we use? And uh, whether whether it's audio, whether it's radio, um, whether it's uh, some kind of visual, and part of the alarm system is flashing lights uh, that lets people know that we need to evacuate the building. What can we do to keep uh, the housekeeping standards uh, up to, uh, up to code? What are we doing internally to make sure that our hallways are kept clear, that we're not blocking the exit doors? and make it clearly clear that where are we meeting? Well, who is uh, uh, who is gonna be there? Along the way, part of the merger, uh, the EAP is the emergency action plan, is detailing who is responsible for the following items. In the case of an emergency or an evacuation and any of that, People have certain jobs and it is because they do the certain jobs so we can, we feel very confident uh, in, the, uh, in the event of an emergency that people will act accordingly. We ran a drill about uh, three weeks ago, uh, almost uh, an evacuation drill. And we did one 
the year prior, and it was night and day difference. Um, people were knew where to go. Uh, people had their go bags, uh, a list of uh, communication radios. Uh, first to stay behind to make sure people were out of the building. Uh, and we keep that information up to date on the emergency action program and the plan itself. We read, it gets evaluated at least once a year or when people need to, or when people switch roles, such as Johnny, when he moved from one role to another, we had to update the EAP. The emergency alarm system has to follow certain standards how they function, and they have to be certified by a third party. You can't, how do you double check it yourself? You can't. Uh, it's required by, by law that it's gotta be certified by a third party. They got to be regularly tested and maintained. That doesn't have to be a, be a Bricks for American Indian Health Project. It can be the third party. And they have, you have to have verified training, which we, we just did not too long ago. And it's got to be effective. What good is a fire alarm if you can't hear it? What good is it if the lights don't go off? It's uh, it's got to be effective. Is or is or go, or you hear the sound, but it's a little the decibels aren't high enough. It's, uh, because you may have people that are hard of hearing, or uh, so those things come into play. Part of the EAP is to address heat illness because even though their risk is low. We have some employees that do have to work outdoors or when you have community events that take place outdoors. So once you, uh, here usually tells you what your body touch to maintain at anything above that, if it's 99, 100, your body is fighting to keep a lower temperature by sweating. And what do we do to, to be prepared of how do we go? Because we just can't stay indoors all the time. We have community events. That has to be work that has to be done uh, that takes place outside. So we want to make sure that we provide shade, uh, water, or hydration, uh, adequate levels. Um, and by law, it doesn't have to be ice cold. It's got to be suitably cool. So if it's 100 degrees outside, 80 degree water is going to taste really good. It's, and you don't want to drink super cold water uh, when your body is running hot. It will cramp up and it will hurt. Um, I did that and I can personally attest that's not something you want to do on a regular. During the EAP, we will identify that we need to do, take certain steps to train maintenance and some supervisors in the event that we need lock, to lock out electrical components uh, to work online. We, uh, one thing that we've done, I know I used to do, Use an old electrician's test to make sure that there was power in the on the wires. Just touch and uh, lick your lick your fingers and just touch the wires to see if the fan was the, there was uh, still power in the uh, in the wires. Yeah, that's not how we do things anymore. People have been uh, been electrocuted or at least zapped. Uh, they've gone uh, and it's not something or electrical shock. I should say, and it's not something we want you to do on on a regular basis. That's gonna just open up the doors to more injuries. But we want to make sure that there's procedures in place. We built procedures uh, in place and put a plan together and train an employee how to use tools to make sure that they can lock out a circuit or breaker effectively and they can't be tampered with anymore. Only that person has a key. Only that person can take off the lock after that person, uh, person uh, completes the job. Handing off the key to somebody is strictly prohibited. And that's something we want to emphasize. With lockout tagout, the only way to control energy is to make sure that the one person that has control maintains control. Once you give away your key, you don't have to control anymore. And that's uh, that can be a fireable offense. Here are some of the uh, when you want to use lockout tagout. And here is specifically the one that applies to because of the American Indian Health is installing or constructing, adjusting, modifying, repairing electrical circuits or electrical components of a circuit. And when we look at, I bring up the hierarchical controls again, because if you look at the top, the best way to eliminate it is elimination. But the, the least effective is PPE, personal protective equipment. 
The reason is, even though you've given them something such as gloves or a hard hat or uh, a face shield, they're still exposed to the hazard. So you, you, there's risk with that because people may not wear it correctly or they may not wear it at all. The responsibility is still on the person. And even though we wanna provide that for them, we wanna have things in place to make sure that they understand the importance of wearing that protective gear. I will do that one time. So with uh, as we said, so our future scope of work um, to going forward um, after we close out a uh, year or two, um, is we're looking at updating our comprehensive emergency plan management plan, updating our emergency action plan. Um, I don't know what those updates will be next year, but there's always room for improvement. So we already know that's gonna be on our agenda for next year. Develop updates, safety policies and procedures. Uh, once again, part of our QI process. Uh, we also plan to create e-learnings to standardize and automate training. Um, a lot of our training has been done in person, uh, which does, uh, of course, it's time, um, it's funds, because you know we contract ready to help us deliver these trainings. Uh, we have a staff member who is being trained to deliver those herself, uh, Ms. Ruby Guzman, who's on the training today as well. Um, but she, you know, it's the time uh, needed for it. Though. And if we can automate a lot of it, then we, um, it'll standardize and we can control it through an online training platform that we use, uh, which is called, uh, called Relias. Um, so potentially for year three, we may be going that route with some of our trainings, not all of them. Um, some trainings are best done in person because the conversation that takes place as part of it is needed, such as active shooter training, uh, proper ergonomics. Um, but some trainings can be uh, delivered, you know, uh, through electronic earning, through uh, learning, through a video recording, um, such as um, I would say uh, a fire extinguisher training. The basic training can be done online. You learn all the technique, you learn everything, but you still have the infield side of it though, where you're you know outside spraying the fire extinguisher because they're fun and you know nothing beats uh, <laughs> nothing beats actually you know doing it yourself though to get in the feel of what it's like. Um, so those are things that are under assessment as well. Um, assess future site specific needs as it relates to emergency preparedness accreditation requirements. So um, going forward, uh, BHP is looking at uh, seeking accreditation. Uh, we've talked about Joint Commission and Triple HC uh, within our organization. Um, and with that, we'll be looking at the safety aspect in terms of the emergency action plan and other uh, areas we need to address um, as part of those accreditation standards and making that an area of priority um, to move forward with. Uh, of course, continuing, uh, continuous quality improvement and quality assurance, that's always ongoing. Uh, one of the major things that we have going on though, um, as it relates to uh, everything we have right now is that BHP was awarded a large grant to build a second story. Um, with that, we will need to, we are gonna continue to operate and stay open during that time, but you're building a floor above an occupied floor. Um, so with that, we have a lot of safety assessments that need to be um, taken into consideration though, on how the business can operate safely, protect everybody. Obviously you don't want a beam dropped into the roof. Um, but we also don't want to slow production by closing off an area though. So uh, those are things that be taken into an account. And then with that, our emergency action plan will be a fluid, a very fluid document throughout the course of construction because things are going to constantly be changing, which it could be one day to the next. And so with that and keeping everybody safe, uh, we want to eliminate um, as many risks as that we potentially can. Um, however, um, you know, we, we need to stay open at the same time. So that's going to be determined as we continue um, to plan for the future construction. These are a couple of pictures. Uh, there's Abel, uh, which is pretty funny. He was wearing the same exact shirt yesterday when we did the drive run. Um, there's the map that he's presenting. There's a picture of all our staff. That's actually our CEO on the picture to the right in the dark blue shirt. This is the rendezvous point uh, for all staff. Um, as you saw on the picture uh, of our emergency evacuation, this is that meeting point. Uh, there's our company vehicles there. Uh, normally, if we're going to do fire extinguisher training, we would do it out there in the parking lot as well. We would close the gate there, move the vehicles out. That way, staff can safely um, utilize the fire extinguishers. And uh, we do have training fire extinguishers. Uh, one of the things that's important is that the training ones can't be live ones. We can't pull the ones we already have in the building and utilize them. We have designated training fire extinguishers that are marked there for training purposes. AB usually fills those for us and then brings them with him. Um, and then staff, you know, go out there and spray them. And thank you guys.
All right, thank you all so much for joining us for our first practice webinar. We also thank our presenters for the wonderful presentation. Um, and let's show our appreciation with the celebration reaction or celebration emoji in the chat box. Thank you, Amaya. Um, the floor is now open for any questions or comments you may have about today's presentation. Please feel free to turn on your cameras and come off of mute, um, or you can place your questions in the chat, and we will have a team member um, monitoring the comments for chat. I mean, monitoring the chat box for comments. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Um, Dawn Lulua with Native American Health Center in Oakland. Um, coming from the Bay Area, no. <laughs> I'm wondering about the active shooter. Um, the so I heard that you wanted to make it as respectful and and as realistic as possible. Um, was there an after survey and how did you fare in the after survey? Or did you just think that was like, maybe we don't need to survey this one? Well, uh, we we did prior to though, it's, it's important to know is that we had training first though. So there was active shooter training was delivered about a week or two before the actual active shooter drill. Um, and that was an opportunity to allow staff to have some visual training. There was a video aspect of it have some Q&A, learn what the expectation is. Um, so we actually gave them all the knowledge first. And with that, we didn't necessarily need a survey uh, per se, because we got a lot of input for, um, up to that point though. One thing that was, um, that we did come aware of though, when we were delivering that this year training is that we did have a staff member who has had trauma, um, has been held at gunpoint in the past. And so with that, we had to take that into consideration as, okay, we're gonna have you sit in, we're gonna have you take place in the documentation side of things, but we'll have you step out during the video and we'll just kind of walk you through the process of everything though. And then when the training actually took place, we removed them from the facility. We didn't want anything to trigger them. Around time and calls any, um, we, we do, you know, we, we didn't want to trigger anything <laughs> ultimately though. So uh, that, that's what ultimately comes down to. So um, with that though, we did a, a walkthrough with them of what it would look like and what the expectations would be though. Um, one of the biggest things that were talked about it, uh, with the staff is, you know, it's either fight or flight. Um, that was one of the points that Abel made during um, our, uh, during the training though. And staff had to understand, you know, that fighting is the last resort. You don't want to get shot though. You want to take flight first, get the word out though. And that was a big focus with it. Afterwards though, um, there was a report um, that was shared by Beretti um, on their assessment of how things went from their, uh, from their perspective, from the actual active shooter though. And then we shared that with the staff. And at that point we did have an, uh, we have a meeting basically with the staff and we talked about it though. And then staff expressed, you know, like, yeah, you know, I, I realized that I should have kept that door closed because they just walked on through like, you know, they walked through the lobby door, you know, said, bang, bang, you guys are dead. And then kept on walking though. And they realized like, wow, closing that door makes that huge of a difference. And we had been telling them, close this door, don't leave it open. So um, it, it was a more short staff expressing how they felt towards it um, but we haven't had any issues since uh, in terms of safety uh, keeping the facility secure since then because now they realize the importance so the, the main feedback we got was that it was a it was an awakening for them okay <laughs> any other questions Um, I did see a couple of comments in the in the chat uh, that I want to touch on. I know Ruby answered about the the map. Um, yeah, we, we use Visio. If the, um, a, I don't know if any of you guys use Text too, but Text if you are entitled to a Microsoft discount, and we use Microsoft 365, so it's only like ten bucks a month for Visio. Um, Ruby self learned She's kind of got the hang of it though. Um, there's probably a lot of other trainees out there as well though, but she's you know getting used to it though. So. It's not much, you only need a, it's a month to month subscription. So you only use it as long as you technically need to. Um, we used to use our map with Excel and uh, we also utilized uh, Adobe Acrobat to edit our documents, but Visio makes it a lot 
easier though, and it's a lot cleaner as well. Um, I don't know if you're able to see the one, the actual picture we initially posted, but then the one by itself on how much cleaner it looks, it's, it looks so much better. Um, and then that's assessed, like I said, uh, reg, uh, at least annually, it, it's taken into consideration. Um, in terms of, uh, I did see a comment from about the Relias. Um, yes, Relias does have a lot of safety and compliance training in there. It is very, it has a vast range of, uh, of trainings in it. There's just so much in there all over the board for everything. Um, so we do utilize whatever we can from there, but there's a lot of site specific trainings as well though, or there's trainings that are specific to, um, to the organization uh, as in terms of you know, us being healthcare and what we actually do because we're healthcare, medical and behavioral health um that we feel are more that would be more suitable for our staff and so Relias does have the ability to create your own content and um, upload into the Relias portal um some of the uh, and it's as easy it's it can even refer you out somewhere to take a training though and track it for you we had that one of the requirements for us is that all staff are required to have annual trainings from IHS um such as the security awareness training um so I Relias tracks that you click on the link it redirects you to the website when you're done with it you go back you answer a question saying, hey, did you complete this? They say, yes, it's on the calendar then for next year. So it automates a lot of that process. So it eliminates us having to constantly be on the staff board to make sure that they're compliant, to make sure that they have their annual training. So it's uh, it's been great. Um, there's a question from Renee about the uh, finding training, uh, a training fire extinguisher. Um, well, fire extinguisher training is uh, what's conducted by Beretti. We do have the paper copies of what they've given us, or digital version of it. Um, that we that we have shared with Nakui in the past, though, um, but we actually have able on site delivering the training in person, though, um, as well, because I can talk about the past they make all day. I can tell you what the steps are to do it, but it's best to actually use a fire extinguisher so you can really feel what it's like to pull that pin, squeeze that handle, you get to feel the weight of it, um, and you get to learn how to aim it as well, though, because generally what I've seen is people either point to down or they're pointing directly at somebody. And it's like you're wasting it. <laughs> you, only, you only have a short amount of time that that fire extinguisher is going to last. And it, and it can be pretty heavy. You know, there's lighter extinguishers, but you have to weigh your risk, though, is that if you have a lighter extinguisher, it's going to be lighter. It's going to be easier to carry, but you're not going to have as much uh, material inside of that, though. And there's different types of fire extinguishers, and those take into play, too. So depending on your type of organization, you're going to want to determine what type of fire extinguisher to have. You know, there's A, B, C. Uh, extinguishers are the most common, but there's also, if you have... Um, what is it? Uh, class is it uh, able correct was Class M, I believe, is is the other one for uh, metals. Uh, uh, class D for metals and Class uh, K for kitchen grease fires. That's what I'm thinking of. So in the kitchen, yeah. you want to make sure you have cast clay. So if you have a fully furnished kitchen, you need to have you should have a Class K in there because the other stuff's not going to do it for you. You need something for the grease and then the uh, class uh, D as well for your electrical uh, materials and metals and such. That's something that it's important as well though. So all of that should be taken into consideration when you're retrofitting your, your facility. With that, the company we contracted with to do our fire extinguishers, they assessed what we needed. So they put them in there. Abel was perfectly fine with them. He didn't, have, he didn't see any issues with them. So, we're like, okay, we're good here. Um, but our training made sure that we covered that as well though, because those are things specific for our facility. We have a full kitchen here. We have stoves. We have oven, so it's good that we have a class K fire extinguisher here. We have a electrical room as well, though, so we have to have a, a different type of fire extinguisher for our server room as well, though. Um, and so we, we have those available for staff to, uh, as part of the training, though. Um, the ones we use outside were just ABC because the technique is pretty much the same um, in terms of the fire extinguisher, though, so we didn't have to worry about that aspect of things, though, but we made sure that everybody had the understanding for it. Um, Brady can be contracted as well, though, to do your training if you're, if you're interested in that, though. They do operate throughout the country. Abel may be unavailable. He's in Hawaii at this time um, on an assignment, so <laughs> he may not be able to attend, but they have a great team, um, such as uh, Mr. Johnny Hernandez is on this call as well, though, and he's one of the active shooter, and um, they just have a wealth of information, and the CEO himself of, of Brady, Inc., Mr. Brady himself, is uh, very, very knowledgeable. I want to. I do want to add to that that um, uh, depending where you're at, where you're located, uh, you may. Uh, it will never say what the training has to de de entail. It will say your people that are going to use site solutions need to be trained. That's it. That is the so it can't. So whether you opt to say, give them just a virtual one because you feel that the 
as an organization using fire exposures may might be too high a liability or too have a risk, which is acceptable and it happens. It just depends on the situation as with anybody. But if we chose to go with uh, extinguish actual live extinguishers with us is not required, but we opted to do it for that for the reasons that Johnny mentioned. Uh, and I'll tell you that uh, there, there's a process involved in that. We want to make sure that people are standing uh, upwind uh, from where they're spraying uh, or they're spraying downwind, uh, that we have people standing off to the side and we're uh, going through the process. We do the evaluation because we don't want to say, okay, you're, you're good. Yes, we show you the, pa uh, the past method and there's a training beforehand, a classroom and then hands-on. But yeah, through this process, uh, I will say this much, uh, Bakers American Indian Health has really just embraced the whole, we want not, we don't want to be just be compliant. We want to build better practices and we want to be able to, uh, pe people don't know that we're coming into in a good working environment because, and it just happens to be safe. It's not, it's, we're not, we're not budgeting you to do safe things. We, these are our standards and they are safety minded. And for myself, it goes beyond that. I mean, you're, we're, we're operating an organization and people's uh, prior, safety is a number one priority. Um, for me, at least, though, you know, uh, we, it can make a difference if somebody living or not. Um, having uh, worked myself personally in the oil fields in the past, though, and uh, people you know, dying in the fields, it's, it's common. Um, that it, it really is really strong. Uh, they advocate on that area for safety, though. So. Um, and all the training that we have, it's, it's a broad range of area, though, but it all ties to, you know, emergency preparedness, though. You know, fire extinguisher training, you know, it's a fire, you're, you're going to put it out, though. But then you also have to worry about, you know, active shooter and somebody come in. And, and those are apparent that those are, uh, those kind of tie, you know, for an emergency happening. But then also, too, there's bloodborne pathogen training as well. Well, you know, bloodborne pathogen, people would think, well, you know, for a hospital, there might be blood and such, but somebody gets shot. There's a bloodborne pathogen there. You know, hazard communication was a big one as well. How do you communicate the hazard? You know, how do you communicate that this area needs to be zoned off and nobody should be there? Uh, where we, uh, our facility is, is large and, it, and it's kind of almost like it has two split sides. I can't just shout and scream where I'm at though and hopefully everybody hears me because only the people in my immediate proximity would hear me. And then I'm at to sit there and call everybody or I may page on our overhead system. But if I page on our system, it's possible that they still don't hear me or some of the volumes and some of the things are turned off. So to combat that, we, we purchased walkies. We have walkie-talkies at the facility. You probably can't see it very well. It's uh, that guy right there. Uh, we purchased a walkie-talkie. So all the managers uh, have a walkie-talkie. We have one at the reception desk. We have some of our admin staff have walkies as well. And this is it's how we communicate, though. So um, if there's a hazard, even when we're in our drill, we can say, hey, we're missing, we, we did a walkthrough. Hey, we're in a, everybody evacuate the facility. We're sending the next person to go in. They communicate via walkie. So there's a constant line of available communication, even in the event of a power outage, though. Um, and, and so it all, you know, like I said, it all ties together ultimately, though, for the importance of our plan, though. It's not so easy as here's our plan. This is where we evacuate to. This is what we do if a fire happens. Uh, it really goes beyond that, though. And how deep, detailed your plan goes will determine, you know, your, how you feel uh, it is as important to your organization, but uh, BIHP itself, you know, wants to take every measure we can. And that's what we're looking at still developing our comprehensive um, uh, emergency plan. Uh, FEMA also has training as well, and they have a tribal day, and we're looking at possibly sending staff there next year um, for training directly from FEMA, though, and go during that week where they have mostly uh, tribal organizations and UIOs are welcome to attend at that time. It's 100% paid. You just you just don't pay per diem, though. So they'll pay for your travel. They have uh, uh, rooms for you to stay in. Uh, they cover the food. They cover all of that. They just don't pay per diem. Um, so that, that's uh, also something as an organization that I would suggest that anybody take advantage of though. And uh, Nikuli is the one who shared us that information I believe, last year. Um, and I, I've heard good things about their program. Does anyone else have any more questions for Johnny and Abel? If not, we can move forward to the next slide, please. So um, Nakui is also hosting many upcoming events that we would love for you all to join. 
Here's a list of our upcoming events. Please visit the NACUI events page for more information and registration links, and the page link will be dropped in the chat. We also have a list of current funding opportunities and their deadlines being offered here at NACUI. We have the Maternal Mortality Review Committee Survey. There is deadline is July 28th. We have the STI survey, which deadline is August 4th, and a grant funding for ECR implementation, which has one spot remaining. Thank you so much for joining this important session. We appreciate any feedback you would like to provide about your session experience. Please complete our session survey by using your phone to scan the QR code on the slide or clicking the link that will be placed in the chat box. Thank you again for attending and have a wonderful rest of your day.